So, well, good morning again, everyone, and uh, thanks for being here online today. Um, so, I'm going to talk about the three blackboards that we have in the collection of the Hugh Lane Gallery. Uh, that's okay, there we go. Um, which many of you will be familiar with. They've, you will have seen them on display before. Um, but this, from later this week, we'll be um, exhibiting them again, but uh, alongside a group of photographs that we've recently acquired from Carolyn Tisdall. So I'm going to talk through, um, I guess, that exhibition. Uh, and uh, I hope it will encourage you to maybe come up to the gallery have a look at the blackboards and Caroline's photographs, which I think provide a, a kind of context um, uh, for, the, for the blackboards. And we've also got photographs from the Ulster Museum's archive as well by Bill Porter. Um, and the exhibition we're calling uh, From the Secret Block to Rosk, and it will open on Saturday. It was previously advertised as opening today, but um, it's actually be opening on Saturday and running through certainly to the end of October. So you've got the, the summer and the spring, summer and autumn uh, to, to come and have a look. So I guess firstly, who was, who's, who was Joseph Voice? Well, he was born in Krefeld in Germany, but grew up in um, Kleve or, or Kleve uh, in Germany. Um, and, and Kleve, is, is often called or, or discussed as being in a kind of a Celtic enclave in Germany. Uh, and he grew up in a Catholic family. Um, he actually fought with the Luftwaffe in World War II. And actually as a, as a teenager had been a member of the Hitler Youth. Um, and he constructed a kind of uh, a narrative or a mythology around his his wartime experiences uh, in that he was shot down over the Crimea um, and uh, kind of recounted a story that he was rescued by nomadic Tatars who uh, wrapped him in felt and animal fat. And this story provided the kind of origins um, for his kind of his, his artistic persona and for his use of, use of unorthodox materials that we'll see. Um, and his, throughout his work, his biography, I think, is really intertwined with his art making. Um, and he did, I think as that story indicates, he did attempt to uh, explore the trauma of the conflict uh, and the potential for healing through art and through creativity in the post-war period. And that's, I mean, you see other um, manifestations of that in the, in the kind of culture from the 40s and 50s the establishment of the documentary exhibition in Castle and of the Edinburgh Art, uh, the Edinburgh Festival, um, were, I guess, uh, attempts to, through culture, to kind of reunite and to heal, um, heal Europe after the war. And that's a, uh, a thread running through all of Boyce's work. After the war, he studied at the Dusseldorf Academy and he later taught there, but was dismissed in the early 1970s uh, as he insisted on free entry for his students and disregarded the institution's limits on, um, on student numbers. So that uh, brought him into conflict with the kind of, the, you know, the, the, uh, the management of the institution and he was dismissed from his post. But um, teaching actually remained important to his work and he talked about it as being the most element, most important aspect of his, his art practice. Uh, he co-founded the Free International University for Creativity and Interdisciplinary Research, a bit of a mouthful, we'll come back to that, which promoted the idea that all individuals should be free to realize their creative potential. Um, and uh, there were attempts to actually establish Dublin as a base for that, for that university, or counter university, if you like, uh, which, didn't, which didn't materialize, but um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so why do we have the blackboards? Um, well, black, blackboards became 
an important part from the early 1970s of Boyce's uh, art practice. As I said, teaching was important and very often in conjunction with his exhibitions or as sort of standalone events, he would, he used the lecture format or the discussion format. And during his talks, he would very often draw, write, create diagrams on these blackboards, which would afterwards um, come artworks. And the three blackboards we have were created in uh, October 1974, when Boyce came to the gallery for an exhibition called The Secret Block for a Secret Person in Ireland. And that exhibition was uh, curated by Carolyn Tisdall, whose, whose photos we also have on display. Um, and Carolyn was the, then the art critic for The Guardian. And she had met Boyce in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival, I think in 1973, through Richard DeMarco. And a few weeks ago, actually, I did a, a conversation with Richard DeMarco, which you, you might have uh, listened to. And uh, Richard um, is an artist and uh, gallery director, and uh, I guess a catalyst for an awful lot of, of contemporary art projects and theatre projects and events that took place in Scotland or have taken place in Scotland since the 1960s. Really, his, his gallery was established, I think, in 1966. And he worked with Joseph Boyce uh, from 1970 through an exhibition of Dusseldorf-based artists called Strategy Get Arts. Um, and actually, he another one of those the artists included was Gunter Ucker, and uh, he first encountered Gunter Ucker's work at Rosk here in Dublin in 1967. Uh, and with one of his nail kind of pictures or artworks, um, which we'll be putting on display alongside the, the Boyce exhibition as well. Um, so there's a slight kind of, I guess, a, a small Dublin connection between DeMarco and, um, and the Dusseldorf artists, which, which led to an ongoing relationship between Richard DeMarco and uh, Joseph Boyce. Um, and very often, their work was exploring this idea of the kind of Celtic consciousness or the Celtic world um, the, and the, the kind of traces and, and energies that, that existed throughout Europe um, from uh, ancient Celtic peoples, which is, I think, just important to understand that wider context for Boyce's interest in, in Ireland and working in Ireland. Um, so through Richard DeMarco, Boyce met Carolyn Tisdall, and then Carolyn organized this exhibition, The Secret Block for a Secret Person in Ireland, uh, originally for the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. And um, it then traveled to, to Dublin, Belfast, Edinburgh, and London. So it became a kind of five venue exhibition, and it was brought to Dublin by uh, Oliver Dowling, who was then at the Arts Council of Ireland. So the Arts Council, uh, sponsored it and organized it. Uh, and he worked with Ethna Waldron, who was curator of the art gallery, of the Hugh Lane Gallery at the time. And the Hugh Lane Gallery then was the venue. Um, it went on to Belfast, as I'll come to in a moment, um, under the auspices of the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. And it's often stated that this was the first, you know, con major contemporary art exhibition that, that went both sides of the border in Ireland that was shown in, um, Dublin and Belfast. And I think that's certainly true of an, a major international artist. But it is interesting to note, though, that the Arts Council of Ireland and um, Arts, Arts Council of Northern Ireland already had a, a kind of a working relationship. And quite a lot of shows were shown uh, under the auspices of both inst institutions, very often in the Hugh Lane Gallery and the Ulster Museum. So there, there was that kind of cross-border dialogue um, happening. So the secret block for a secret person in Ireland actually was originally just called the secret block for a secret person when it was conceived for um, the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. And only after Oliver Dowling approached um, the organizers to, to bring it to Dublin, did Boyce kind of rename the exhibition and added in, in Ireland. Um, it comprised 266 drawings, which were made between 1936 and 1972. Uh, the poster actually was, was, was wrong there. So, um, and Boyce called these thinking forms. And 
he used the term block for a kind of group of works that he assembled. Um, and I guess the, the idea that they maybe had a kind of collective energy. And he, the, the drawings weren't created with Ireland in mind, but as I said, the, the title was added afterwards. Um, and these were drawings that he'd kind of been creating and held, um, hadn't been exhibited, uh, that kind of traced over the decades his, his thought process and used drawing as a kind of tool to uh, work through ideas and to uh, express ideas. Um, so this is the poster for the exhibition in Dublin. And actually, it was, a, it was a poster created for Oxford and it was uh, used in all the different venues and it shows Boyce leaning over a table or his, his hands um, with, a, with a pencil in hand. And as we'll see, Boyce had a very strong, um, I guess, public persona and a very uh, kind of, I guess, crafted persona of, of, as an artist. And his physical appearance was very distinctive. He usually wore a hat and he had kind of very particular clothes that he, he wore um, that make him really identifiable. And his image was used in a, an awful lot of his posters. So um, he, he kind of inserts himself uh, as I was saying, the, the relationship between the artist and his biography uh, and the work is, is very close and intertwined. Um, and it's interesting, this is Boyce actually in the gallery. I think the, um, the one photo we have in our archive of, of Boyce in the gallery with the curator, Ethna Waldron. Um, and then you see in a lot of the press coverage, it's, it's the photo, it's the image of the man, it's the image of Boyce in his hat. Uh, that is used in the newspapers as opposed to the drawings. The drawings themselves are often very um, delicate uh, and, and sensitive. Um, there's, there was a nice review, an interesting review of it by an artist called John Walker. Um, and I'll just read a little bit of that. But this was from the showing in Oxford. I'll read a little bit of that as it uh, kind of gives us, I think, a sense of, of the work. Thematically, the drawings concern the transition between or the coexistence of such polarities of active, passive, warm, cold, soft, hard, male, female, chaos structure, earth, heaven, animal, human, body, soul, life, death. These themes and motives, motifs are variously combined and developed throughout the sequence of drawings, but the elusiveness of Boyce's technique means that in most instances, the viewer has to struggle hard to decipher the imagery, to single out the individual elements from the multiple layers of pensive notation. And he concluded that the draw drawings demonstrate Boyce as an immensely gifted artist, but doubts remain as to whether he's evolved a plastic form capable of communicating his thinking to an audience. And in Dublin, um, I think there was some resistance to the work. So the, the exhibition is, you know, it's hundreds of drawings. It took up, I think, five galleries in on the ground floor of the uh, of the Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, and so that's, uh, so there's a sense actually of one of the drawings. This is the private view card from the exhibition here in 74. Uh, it's opened by Carolyn Tissel. Um, and you see one of the drawings from the exhibition on, on the right there. Uh, and a lot of the, the um, press coverage was a little bit dismissive, shall we say. Um, the arty craft is, had been having a whale at the time. Um, and there's a sense uh, maybe from some people that, you know, that that the artist was a, a kind of a charlatan. Um, but there was equally, I think, a very strong uh, response um, in favor of the work. But it was, I guess he was an artist that um, maybe kind of inspired um, kind of polar responses. Uh, in the Irish Times, Brian Fallon also had some uh, praise for the artist. He says, in fact, he's a serious artist with a wide range of techniques and a striking flow of wit and invention. 
His basic strength seems to be as a draftsman with the weight of a vital graphic tradition behind him. And he ignites into color quite beautifully, but is at home in black and white. Um, although he does conclude that Boyce is an artist of obvious and fertile talent, but he's scarcely uh, a major one. Um, so during the exhibition of drawings here in Dublin, um, he, so let's get through a little bit. He gave a number of lectures or discussions actually as they were billed as. Um, so at the, or around the time of the opening of the exhibition here, he traveled to Limerick and to Cork and gave uh, lectures at the um, Limerick Art Gallery and, and Library, as it was at the time, and at the Crawford Gallery in Cork. Um, and the blackboards from those events didn't, uh, didn't survive. Um, the, in fact, in Limerick, a blackboard wasn't available, so they, they turned a, a table on its side, um, and he, he drew on that. and. and sketched and, and wrote on that um, but obviously they needed you know to put the table back into use the next day so that one didn't survive but in Dublin three blackboards did so he used blackboards to expand his thinking in ways that um, maybe his drawings could not in the Irish Times, he gave an interview in which he said, after 1970, drawings like diagrams and discussions appear, and it's more like theoretical actions. Now the stress lies more and more in my lectures and discussions, because now I feel it is a necessity not to change the appearance and the characters of art, like innovations in the art historical line, but that it is necessary to change art itself. Um, and he began using blackboards in the 1960s, but as I said, from 1970, they become uh, they begin to play a bigger role. And actually, the, the blackboards were borrowed from schools next to the gallery, um, from Colossal Wirra, and I think also from Belvedere College. Uh, and replacement blackboards were then purchased for the schools to, to be returned to the schools so that the blackboards uh, could uh, enter the collection of the Hulane Gallery and could be pre preserved. So the, the artist gave them to the gallery afterwards and he signed the back of the blackboards uh, after the event as well. Um, and they can be, I think, a little bit, you know, hard to fathom. Um, and we'll get to the controversy that um, erupted in 1977 over them. And I think that was largely because it's hard to kind of look at these maybe in conventional art historical terms. If you kind of think of a, looking at them at a, alongside, alongside say a Sean Keating painting or the visual language is completely different. You know, this is a, a trace of an event. Um, it, it, it maybe needs a different kind of uh, tools to, to kind of, to try and to decipher it and to, to look at it and to understand it. Um, and, you know, these were, I guess, spontaneous um, marks and thoughts and words that kind of flowed out of the, the discussion or the lecture that he was giving. Although there's words that um, reappear. I don't know if you can make them out there, but you can see freedom, creativity, art, science, um, socialism, brotherhood, central bank. Um, so there's different terms that reappear in different blackboards uh, and are kind of key key ideas that he returns to in his, in his thinking and teaching. Um, and in terms of his interest in um, in Ireland, one of them, one of the aspects was Irish literature, and James Joyce was um, a key influence from early on. And this this little sketch here, these kind of marks in the centre of this blackboard, have even been interpreted as a portrait of Joyce 
uh, when you think about his face with the, with the glasses. And then the third blackboard has um, a kind of diagram of a sun uh, on the right there with the term sun state. Um, and this is actually uh, this form, the diagram of the sun with those terms uh, applied to it also appears in an earlier blackboard from 1974, which he did in Chicago. Um, and this kind of represents this idealized uh, ideal state um, where the kind of en where energy, the energy from the sun, uh, and kind of uh, cultural um, and uh, or the cult kind of cultural and political aspects of life come together in this kind of ideal form, in this ideal balanced kind of unity. Um, and that you can see the similar motif down there at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the blackboard that he created in Chicago and that's now in the uh, collection of MoMA in New York. And so for this display that we put together this this week or putting together and we'll open on Saturday, um, we have I think for the first time uh, shown photos of Boyce delivering his lecture in Dublin. Um, and so Carolyn is still, uh, as I said, met Boyce in 1973 and then continued a, a, a very close working relationship and friendship with the artist and produced um, an extraordinary kind of photographic archive that documents his work um, around the world. Um, and she's published a number of books uh, one is called We Go This Way, another one was Coyote, which was a documentation of, of a performance he gave in New York. Um, and she also curated an exhibition at the Guggenheim in New York in 79. So a lot of her photos have been um, published and exhibited and provide a, an extraordinary record of his, his work and also a very good understanding, I think, of, of his thinking. Um, but I think these photos from Dublin haven't been shown or published before, so um, we're kind of excited to show them. Uh, you can see the blackboards behind Boyce in the gallery. Um, and alongside that, we have a series of photographs from the Ulster Museum archive, which um, are quite different in their feeling, but also give a very good sense of the uh, event that took place in, in Belfast. So the exhibition in Dublin took place in, uh, in October 1974, and then the secret block for a secret person in Ireland traveled to Belfast. Um, and again, Boyce uh, gave lectures or discussions um, in Derry at the McGee Institute at the new University of Ulster in Coleraine, um, and at the Art College in Belfast and at the um, Ulster Museum itself. And um, initially the exhibition was planned to, to take place um, in the Arts Council of Ireland Gallery in Belfast, Arts Council of Northern Ireland Gallery rather, uh, but actually because of, a, I think, a bombing on that street that, that wasn't possible, so the, it was moved to the Ulster Museum. Um, just a reminder, I guess, of the, you know, the context that he's, he's visiting um, Ireland at the time uh, in, in the midst of the troubles. And it was, as you can see, hopefully, have I got a, yeah, as you can see here on the left, um, it was particularly well attended in Belfast. Uh, I think though, um, they kind of bust people in from uh, community groups and there were curfews in the city at the time. So, um, you know, people had to, it was perhaps a little more managed. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for my notes on, uh, on the Belfast lecture. And again, as you can see, and this, these are quite, quite nice too, you see the relationship in these photographs, uh, I think, to the audience. Um, 
on the right there, you know, people from the audience came up and gave uh, gave their opinions or asked questions or contributed to the discussion. And actually, that's Carolyn Tinsel there on the on the left uh, of the image, the left of the image on the right, if that makes sense. Um, and then they also kind of chart the development of the blackboard, so you can kind of see the process um, as Boyce spoke and engaged with the audience, but then also drew uh, and referred to the blackboard. And um, some of the terminology in the Dublin blackboards and the Belfast, Belfast blackboards is the same. Um, you see key words and phrases that he often used, freedom, art, brotherhood, love, socialism. Um, and in the image on the right, you see the three spirals. And he took that from a carving that he, was, he saw at Newgrange. And um, he visited Newgrange with Oliver Dowling and with Cecil King, the artist whose work we also have on display uh, at the moment. So we have a photo of them, the three of them at Newgrange together, which is a nice, really nice connection to the exhibition of Cecil King's work that we have um, on display. Um, And the four blackboards uh, survived are in, and are in the, the Ulster Museum collection uh, now. Again, the form of the sun um, with the term Earth, new planet uh, on the upper left. Um, and energy was hugely important to Boyce, uh, spiritual as well as kind of physical energy. Um, and I think that's that's part of the his interest in um, the ancient Celtic world that that he understood and he he believed in, in looking at the carvings from Newgrange when he visited there that the ancient Celts had a deep understanding of um, of spiritual and physical energies and that the carvings there were kind of evidence of this and um, and he Actually, earlier he had made a blackboard called uh, The Brain of Europe, and Carolyn Tistle had sketched out the different kind of political, um, a range of political op opinion in Ireland uh, to try and kind of uh, maybe to explain to him some of the context, uh, social and political context for his visit. And he used that kind of diagram with different positions on it uh, in, in a blackboard which he later showed in New York in 1975. Um, and he called it the brain of Europe. And he talked about Ireland as being um, the, the kind of Im imagination organ for, the, uh, for Europe, for the continent, and a place where he felt was open to new ideas. And in part of this, he was looking back to the, the early Christians and to St. Columba, that it was a place um, where new ideas could be generated and uh, embraced and transmitted. So we saw a lot of potential here. Um, now, some people felt that, that was an overly kind of romanticized uh, view. Um, I think his, his perception was that Ireland at that time uh, was less industrialized, was more agrarian in terms of its economy uh, compared to much of Europe. So it had the potential, um, it maybe hadn't been tarnished in a way by, by a lot of kind of modern developments. Um, but obviously, you know, there was kind of criticism that this was an overly uh, romantic view of, of the country. Um, and in Northern Ireland, uh, again, he provoked kind of really strong um, opinions. There is a, a fascinating um, video which was produced by London Weekend Television um, in 1974, documenting his visit to uh, Northern Ireland. It was made by Derek Bailey. And we're hoping to show that alongside the exhibition. Um, and in it, he meets a woman in the street and she uh, tells him, she asks him where he's from and he says, I'm from Germany. And he, she tells him that uh, he's just picking over Ulster's bones you know, she says, oh, everyone's coming here. That's all you are doing, picking the carcass. So, um, and the artist John Carson later wrote um, or, and said in an interview that she was not the only one to throw such accusations in the face of the publicity circus surrounding Boyce's visit to, quote, our troubled province. So um, there was some, you know, 
uh, rejection um, of his thinking and his his advocacy of um, the role of the artist as someone that could that could perhaps heal society through art and through creativity. Um, and actually, this is from a recent book by Askeek and Contemporary Arts on John Carson. And these are kind of satirical um, student uh, student publications uh, from from Boyce's visit to Ireland in, in 1974. Um, so he did have a big impact, but it was it was no means um, you know all positive. And uh, you know, I think some people just you know saw it as a big. Um, circus you know this this kind of uh major international figure and who does you know who does he think he is kind of coming here and um telling us you know how to live but having said that there was a huge positive response um he visited the art college uh, in belfast and um while a lot of the staff members were resistant uh, and actually didn't want him, didn't, some cases didn't want him in the building, uh, a lot of students did respond very favorably uh, that he was talking about social and, and political context for art, which, um, which a lot of students felt their lecturers were maybe ignoring. Uh, and in the Arts in Ireland, Brendan Watson, who was a, a postgrad student at the time, wrote, um, a defense against the, what he called the positively fearful reaction of many of the lecturers. And he praised the artist's demonstration uh, for the necessity for genuine purposeful dialogue about our social problems. Um, so that, I better, I, I, I'm going on a bit longer than I thought. So uh, I better skip along now to 1977 so the exhibitions passed off. Um, obviously, he had quite a big uh, impact. Um, and actually, just a, a note further about um, Northern Ireland. Uh, a number of Northern Irish artists visited um, Documenta, which is a big exhibition that happens in Kassel in Germany every five years. So Boyce took uh, a project, which I mentioned earlier, the Free International University, to Documenta in uh, 1978, I think, yeah. Uh, and brought with over a number of artists from Northern Ireland. And that was then a kind of catalyst for um, the organization of a group called Art and Research Exchange. So it had quite a tangible, um, a tangible result his his visit to to Belfast uh, in terms of this kind of um, ongoing relationship or for the, at least for the next few years under the umbrella of the Free International University which then kind of was a catalyst for the establishment of Art and Research Exchange which also then led to say the founding of Circa Art Magazine so it's kind of a chain, chain of events that maybe um, set in place by Boyce's uh, visit in 1974. Meanwhile, in Dublin, um, the works were, the blackboards from his lecture were ex accepted into the collection. Uh, that was fine. Um, and then Ethna Waldron put them on display for the first time in 1977. And a huge controversy actually erupted there. This is three, two and a half, three years after the initial event. Um, and people, didn't believe this was art, it should be taken down. Um, a member of the arts advisory group resigned. Uh, the cultural committee of the city council um, passed a motion that they should be taken off display. Uh, there's considerable press coverage. As I've got some of the headlines on screen there, German art gift, not art. Um, and a lot of people just, you know, saw this as scribbles, as kind of doodlings, as trivial, um, and uh, it shouldn't be hanging alongside other, you know, works in the collection. Um, a lot of people in the art world, both in Ireland and overseas, wrote letters in support of Ethna World from the curator, 
And uh, as you can see on the bottom headline there, the city manager at the time backed her and the works were uh, kept on display. They were though taken down as planned for Rosk in 1977. And just briefly to, I guess, to, to end um, on some of the other exhibitions of Boyce and other events and projects that took place because it wasn't just 1974, though I think um, that's the most, perhaps the most substantial and most, um, the visit that had the most impact uh, and of course we have the, the, the blackboards kind of as a, as a memory of that event, but uh, there was a kind of ongoing engagement. Um, the Free International University was um, founded by Boyce and by Heinrich Böll, the uh, German writer uh, and other figures in 1973. Um, and it expressed, or I guess was a vehicle for, for voices thinking that uh, creativity should be used or every human should be um, free to kind of explore and unleash their, their own creativity. It was a phrase that's often quoted in relation to voice that um, everyone is an artist and he didn't necessarily mean that everyone should, you know, should be a professional artist, but everyone has creative potential um, and that, that, and that we should all be free to kind of un unleash that. Uh, so that was the, um, the thinking in part behind the Free International University that, that it would kind of be a, an institution that could um, operate, an educational institution that would operate differently to a conventional university and maybe have, you know, bases, uh, uh, in different places and at different times. And um, the art critic Dorothy Walker was a keen advocate of that in Dublin. She wanted to, uh, I guess, reform art education in Ireland. Um, and they came close to establishing a centre here in Dublin. There was um, various sites were explored. Uh, you can see on the photo which we have on display, maybe a little bit small, but that's Boyce actually visiting the Royal Hospital in Kilmainham. So that, that came close to becoming a centre uh, for the Free International University. And um, of course, that, that's now the home of Emma. So it ultimately did become a centre for contemporary art, but maybe not quite as, as they had envisaged. Um, and Carolyn Tisdall and Robert McDowell even wrote a big briefing paper to the, uh, to the um, European Economic Community you know, and funding was, was sought, but uh, I think ultimately funding was the, the big stumbling block to establishing the Free International University uh, in, in Dublin. But um, Dorothy Walker there, a kind of key figure uh, in terms of the relationship of Boyce to Ireland. Um, his work was shown again in 1978 at the Project Art Centre. Uh, In 1974, so the same year, actually just a few months before he came to Dublin, he had uh, created um, a performance or an action as he called them in New York called I Like America and America Likes Me. Um, perhaps his most famous performance in which he flew to America, to New York, uh, was transported, was kind of wrapped in felt and transported um, to, the gallery and without ever I think transported in an ambulance and so he never kind of touched the, touched the ground uh, in New York transported to the gallery uh, and spent three days in the gallery with a coyote so the coyote and Joseph Boyce were um, uh, lived coexisted cohabited so uh, and this relationship or this unfolding relationship of this um, animal who had been particularly in maybe in Western um, colonial American thinking uh, being much maligned as a kind of dangerous animal 
he sought to um, establish a relationship with. And the three days were documented by Carolyn Tisdall and she later published a book uh, of the documentation. So that, um, and you, you see the voice with his, his, his blanket uh, and a walking stick uh, and trying to kind of um, negotiate this, um, this relationship with this kind of um, wild animal, uh, which is being kind of, you know, locked up with a human being for three days and each day new new um issues of the new york times would be i think it was the new york times would be delivered uh, and of course the the coyote had little respect for them um and then at the end of the three days boyce returned to uh, to the airport and in the ambulance and left and so project uh ex exhibited um carolyn tisdale's exhibition or documentation of that event um in 1978. And then Boyce uh, was shown twice in the Rothke exhibitions. Um, so I'm, I'm sure many of you know, Rothke exhibitions were a series of major exhibitions of international contemporary art, um, which began in 1967. And the 1977 exhibition was um, shown here at the Hulang Gallery and the work fat up to this level, uh, which is on the right, was shown in the gallery. It's now in the collection of Kunstam and Nordrhein Westfalen and, and Dusseldorf. Uh, and you have these, these lead sheets with this kind of propped uh, rod. Uh, and there's um, incisions on the sheets that indicate uh, the, um, the level up to which, fat should, um, if it was kind of enclosed by these, these forms. Um, and so fat is one of these kind of uh, symbolic materials going back to that story about him being um, shot down in World War II. Uh, and one of his, the unorthodox materials that he, that he used that he saw as a source of, of warmth, of insulation uh, and, and spiritual as well as um, uh, um, physical warmth. Um, and related to that, the, the two works on the left there that you can see, there's one, I think it's coal and peat briquettes sandwiched together with butter and, and one work uh, sandwiched, two peat briquettes sandwiched together with butter. So these are works that he made in Ireland that he called Irish energies. So again, butter, an Irish material, um, but again, relating this idea of fat and uh, a, a substance which would that would kind of retain or create energy. And peat too, of course, um, another source of energy. And he was particularly interested in, in bog lands. And um, I think it's interesting to look at these works now, you know, at this point where the, the kind of climate crisis that um, the value of bog lands in terms of uh, um, holding carbon uh, become to the fore and the you know the, the industrial harvesting of, of peat is, is maybe coming to an end uh, and he was looking at peat bogs in and their potential for energy and kind of looking at and questioning it and environmental concerns um, you know emanate throughout his work and actually he was a, a co-founder of the Green Party in, in Germany um, and those two works there in the photo on the bottom left were actually shown also in Rosk 1977, not in the Hulane Gallery as with the other work, but actually at the Bank of Ireland, which I think is slightly, yeah, slightly mad kind of concept that these two really odd, odd objects, odd art, art objects were kind of ex exhibited in the Bank of Ireland on, on I think on uh, College Green, because the Bank of Ireland was, was one of the sponsors of Rosk 77. So, um, a very odd thing to encounter, you know, when you're going into a bank um, to to see these these strange uh, these strange objects. And then uh, on the left, there are news cutting from Rosk '84. So Boyce returned actually uh, in 1984 to Dublin, and uh, an exhibition of his drawings again was shown uh, as part of um, as part of Rosk. Um, so these. There's also, I mean, there's lots of things to touch on, but I, I might stop 
talking now. The image at the top, you may well recognize the site. That's, uh, that's at Sandy Cove. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, Boyce had a particular interest in, um, in James Joyce, uh, particularly for his unorthodox and experimental use of language, which was another issue that um, Boyce really pushed. And um, he actually created a uh, series of notebooks with sketches and drawings, um, which he saw as a kind of an addition to Ulysses that um, these, these six notebooks were kind of six additional chapters, if you like, to Ulysses, um, but extended in that through drawing rather than through um, written language. Um, it was hoped in 1977 there was a plan that these would be shown in the voice, sorry, in the Joyce Tower. Um, and actually that slipped there. I think he kind of delighted in the fact that, you know, voice and Joyce maybe rhymed. Um, there was a hope that these six uh, notebooks that he conceived as an extension to um, Joyce's Ulysses might be shown at the Joyce Tower in 1977, but because of their fragility, that didn't, didn't happen. But um, just, yeah. So I hoped to then just give you a flavor of what happened here in 1977 why we have the blackboards, and then to show Caroline Testel's photographs that, and also Bill Porter's photographs, which I think, I, I hope when you visit the gallery will kind of give you a sense of their, their context. Um, and then just to note that kind of ongoing relationship to, to Ireland um, in, throughout the 1970s and 1980s, uh, that it didn't, didn't end, if you like, with, with the secret block. So, I'll stop there and if you have any questions, comments, um, 